This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org to discover more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spooktacular people. Welcome to this 278th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast. Ghost tours for the theater of the mind. I am your host, Diane. This episode, we're going over to Scotland to a very creepy location that has a lot of hauntings connected to it. The Edinburgh Vaults. I actually have had some friends who visited here and had their own ghostly experiences that I'm looking forward to sharing with you. There's a lot of stuff that happened here. There's a deep history, and that has led to a lot of hauntings. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Sarah with no H, Deborah with an R-A-H, Lorraine, Thalia, Kirsten, Jenny with a Y, and Shalise. Welcome to the Spooktacular crew, everybody. And now, this moment in oddity. There's a legend out of Connecticut that is a variation on the Bigfoot legend, and this is the story of the Winstead Wild Man. This creature was first reported in 1895 in the Winstead Herald as a large man, stark naked and covered with hair all over his body, who ran out of a clump of bushes. The person to witness the wild man was town selectman Riley Smith. He'd been out in the woods looking for berries with his bulldog when the creature appeared, terrifying both the man and his dog. Smith described it as a wild, hairy man of the woods, six feet in height, and the man's hair was black and hung down long on his shoulders, and that his body was thickly covered with black hair. The man was remarkably agile and to all appearance was a muscular, brawny man, a man against whom any ordinary man would stand little chance. Two other men saw the Winstead Wild Man and speculation started as to who or what this thing could be, with the Winstead Herald speculating that the Wild Man may have been Arthur Beckwith an escaped mental patient from the nearby Litchfield Sanitarium. The Winstead Wild Man seemed to disappear until 80 years later when he was seen again in 1972. The Hartford Courant reported that a strange man-like creature was observed by two young men on Winchester Road near Crystal Lake Reservoir. They described it as eight feet tall and covered with hair that walked upright and finally disappeared into the woods. People said it was just a bear, but the two men were emphatic that it was no bear. The Wildman was seen again in 1974 by two couples parked at night. They said they saw a 6-foot, 300-pound creature covered with dark-colored hair. Police could find nothing. There are those who claim the story was just made up by Lewis Timothy Stone, the editor of the Winston Herald, in order to sell papers. This seems to be something he did quite a bit. But how to explain the more recent sightings? If the Winston Wildman was anything more than just a bear, that would certainly be odd. Get out. And now, this month in history. In the month of October, on the 31st in 1828, William Burke and William Hare kill their final victim. The Judgment of Death Act of 1823 required judges to enter a sentence of death on the court record, but they could then commute the sentence to imprisonment. Medical and anatomical schools were only allowed to use the bodies of condemned criminals for dissection. This act made the availability of bodies very limited, and thus the unscrupulous practice of grave robbing took root. William Hare immigrated to Scotland from Ireland and eventually became keeper of a lodging house in Edinburgh. William Burke was also Irish-born, and he arrived at the lodging house in 1827. 
An old pensioner died in the house, and so his rent went unpaid. Hare was upset about losing the money and stole the body from its coffin with the help of Burke and sold it to a surgeon named Robert Knox. The men were happy with their profit and decided to do more of this. Only they didn't grave rob, they just murdered people and sold the bodies. It's believed they killed at least 15 unknown wayfarers who stayed at the lodging house. They would get the men and women drunk and then smother them. Their last victim was Marjorie Dotry, whom they killed and hid under a bed on Halloween. They tried to keep the guests who were staying in that room from entering, but they entered anyway and discovered the body. Burke's wife tried to bribe them to be quiet, but it was reported and soon the multiple murders were discovered. Hare turned King's evidence and was released and disappeared. Burke was tried for murder, found guilty, and hanged. The Burke and Hare case inspired the horror films The Body Snatcher from 1945 and The Flesh and the Fiends from 1959. In the late 18th century, two bridges were built in Edinburgh to help the city to expand over the hills that were part of the area, and these were the North Bridge and the South Bridge. The South Bridge linked the Old Town's High Street with the university buildings on the south side of the city and housed a number of chambers that were first used for businesses and later became a seedy part of the city. These chambers are known today as the Edinburgh Vaults. Because of some of the illegal activity and the living conditions in the vaults, they were reputedly the most haunted site in Scotland. Join me as we explore the history and hauntings of the Edinburgh Vaults. My parents have both been to Scotland, and when I told my mom that I was looking at the Edinburgh vaults and I was trying to get a feel for where they were located, she whipped out all these maps to show me the different streets and such there. So I have a pretty good feel for how the city is laid out. And it seems that the North Bridge and the South Bridge are split by High Street. And High Street is about a mile long, and it's a very historical street there in Scotland. A lot of things happened along that road. The Edinburgh vaults of the South Bridge are located within chambers formed in the 19 arches of the bridge. Construction on the vaults began in 1785, and it was completed in 1788. The bridge consisted of these 19 stone arches. It hit 31 feet at its highest point and spanned a chasm just over 1,000 feet long. There were three levels to the bridge. The street level had storefronts that included taverns and markets, The level below the street was used for cobbler and other tradesmen workshops and storage. The third level contained 120 rooms, which were used for living space. As I searched out the history and got different stories about different time periods and such, I don't believe that at the very beginning that these living spaces were meant to be lived in when the bridge was first built. Eventually, they'll be used that way. I think they mainly were supposed to be just for storage because it really was not a place that anybody would want to live. This arrangement that I just described for you with these three different levels that were mainly for stores and tradesmen and such lasted for about 30 years. The red light district would form after this time, but even before that, there were some operations starting that were outside of the normal businesses, like this report on Saturday, July 1st, 1815 in the Edinburgh Evening Courant. On the 24th, Mr. McKenzie, supervisor, accompanied by Gorey and McNaughton officers, discovered a private distillery of considerable extent under the arch of the South Bridge, which has been working these 18 months past to the great injury of the revenue. The particulars of this seizure are worthy of notice from the great pains which had been taken to prevent disclosure. The original door to the place where the operations were going forward had been carefully built up and plastered over so as to prevent any appearance of an entrance. Behind a grate in the fireplace of a bedroom, an opening had been made and fitted with an iron door and lock, exactly fitting the grate, which could only be seen by being removed, and this passage led to the flat, above by a trap door and ladder, where the still was working. This place again was in one of the deaf arches, immediately adjoining the middle arch of the bridge, now the cave's venue, and the person had found means to convey a pipe from one of the town's branches, which gave a plentiful supply of water. A soil pipe was also got at, and a hole broke through into a neighboring vent to carry off the smoke. Besides the still, a considerable quantity of wash and some low wines were found in the premises, also many casks, mash tun, large tubs, etc. The spirits were said to have been conveyed away in a tin case made to contain two or three gallons, 
which was again put into a green bag and carried out by a woman under her cloak. So back here in 1815, we have some of the stuff that probably would have been going on over here in America during Prohibition happening there. There wasn't any kind of prohibition going on, but apparently they were taking some money out of the revenue of maybe the government by making their own spirits here. So I thought that was pretty interesting to share with you guys and the way that they were hiding it. But most of the businesses that were here were the real deal. They were legal cobblers, people making clothing, selling supplies and food and things like that. Things for the vaults changed after huge cracks began to form in the bridge. The South Bridge that had been considered an engineering marvel was actually flawed, and these cracks that formed allowed water and waste from the city to flow into the vault's lower levels. The conditions deteriorated rapidly, and the businesses left in the 1820s. They were replaced with the poor and homeless of the city moving inside the vaults, and in 1845, the vaults were overwhelmed with Irish immigrants trying to get away from the potato famine. Slum lords took advantage of the desperate people and would cram as many people into a space as they could, which usually amounted to 10 people living in a space meant for one person. Conditions were so bad that the residents began moving out in the 1860s. So you can imagine these lower levels in the bridge were not a place anybody would want to live anyway. And then you've got these cracks that are allowing all of the waste from the city to come down into where you're living. We know in the 1800s that medicine was not what it is today. Obviously, people would get sick when they were in all these cramped living quarters. So you can only imagine what was breeding inside these vaults, which had no light, not a lot of air, and people living on top of each other. It must have just been a horrendous way to live. And obviously, it did get so bad that even people who were poor and couldn't afford to live anywhere else said, we got to get out of here. And I can't imagine how many people must have died down in those vaults just due to the disease that would have been rampant because of the living conditions that were there. There's a lot of people who said, nobody lived there. Come on. There's no way anybody could live there. But a man discovered an opening back in the 1980s, and he kind of opened it up a little bit and discovered all of these caverns that were down under this bridge. So they started doing excavations there in 1985. And that's when we start getting proof that people had once lived here, even though the historical record really didn't document it. And a lot of people thought that they were just rumors or legends. They found dishes, medicine bottles, toys, and other household goods. And one of the reasons why people didn't really know about people having lived down there is not only was there not a record of it, but they had decided back in the 1860s when everybody started moving out, This is such a horrible place. We got to close this up. So they just filled it all in with rubble and sealed it up so that nobody could go back down there again. They wanted to make sure that they would have no squatters. And so effectively, it passed this whole period of time and what happened here out of the general conscience of the public. Now, going back to the time where the tradesmen have left, you have these disreputable businesses that moved in. So not only do you have the poor who were looking for a place to live, but when the reputable businesses left and the slumlords are running the place, they said, hey, this would be a great spot for a red light district. And so that's what moved in here. And then you had smuggling operations that were carried out and people obviously were murdered down here as well. The cramped spaces became a hiding place for body snatchers who needed dark places to come and go more easily. There are even rumors that in the 1820s, the infamous serial killers William Burke and William Hare lurked within the vaults and may have killed some of their 16 victims there. I found no evidence to back that up. And as you guys heard in the month in history that I detailed, the murder seemed to have happened at the boarding house that they both were running, not in the vaults. That doesn't mean that they didn't go into the vaults, find some poor people there that needed a place to stay for the night and said, hey, why don't you come stay at our boarding house? Maybe they pretended that they were being kind hearted. I'm not sure. So it is possible that they did go into the vaults and get their victims there, but I don't believe that they killed anybody in the vaults. So obviously the South Bridge had a horrible reputation as being a slum. There was a decades old belief that the bridge was cursed and the reason that it was cursed was because of the first person to cross the expanse. It was decided before the bridge was completed that a well-known and respected judge's wife should be the first to cross. I don't know if it was more of an honor to him to have his wife cross if he'd passed away. And so they were honoring him through her. Not sure how that all worked out. But several days before the bridge was open, the woman passed away. 
The city fathers felt that they should keep up their end of the deal because they said, hey, we'd love to have you come across. So what they did is they decided to put her in her coffin and why don't we carry her across the bridge in her coffin? I don't see a real issue with it. But keep in mind that the people of Edinburgh are a superstitious people. So you have this brand new bridge that you've built. And the first thing that you're going to take across that is a dead body. Well, these superstitious people are like, that's a bad idea. I don't think that's the way that we want to initiate the bridge. So they all felt that because a dead body was the first thing taken across that bridge, it was forever cursed. And based on the history that it had, it almost seems that way. It just kind of went downhill. You had these businesses in there. They didn't stay very long. Then it becomes the slum. And then eventually it's just all filled in and you can't use any of that for anything anymore. So was this just superstition about the bridge or could it really be true that it was cursed? And what of the claim that the Edinburgh vaults are the most haunted place in Scotland? Is that true? One of the main areas that ghost tours in Edinburgh visit is the Blair Street vaults, which are part of the South Bridge and can be entered through Barry's Close. And for those of you who don't know, a close is basically an alleyway in Scotland. Really quick side note on this. You guys know I love to talk about synchronicity on this podcast. It happened a couple of times this weekend. It was so weird. I'm going to be on the most recent episode of Twisted Philly talking about spiritualism and the Fox Sisters with Dina Marie. And as we were talking about the history with the Fox Sisters, I was talking about how there would be this knocking on the wall and that it would be knock once for yes and then twice for no. And as I was talking about knock once for yes, obviously I had to mention my good friends Lil and Fitz over at the Knock Once for Yes podcast. I said, oh, that's a great podcast. You guys should be checking it out. I had no idea that at the same time that Dina was interviewing me, her fiance, Jeremy, who hosts the podcast we listen to, was also recording an interview. And guess who he was recording it with? Lil and Fitz of Knock Once for Yes. (laughs) So I just love how that stuff happens. Dina told me that after we got done with the interview, she said she didn't want to say anything while we were doing the interview. And I just went, you got to be kidding me. I mentioned their podcast out of all the podcasts I could mention in the world. And they happen to be being interviewed at the same time as me in the same home. It's just mind-blowing. Another thing that happened is April Barber, who's one of the members of the Spectacular crew. April's been with us for forever. And uh, she had posted this picture in the Spectacular crew that a photographer had taken over in Scotland. He's a Scottish photographer, and he takes all these pictures over there. And it's this really creepy picture where you're going down these stairs into a, an alleyway or a close. And I was like, what is that? That's so cool. I got to know more. So I zoom in on it and I could see what the name of the photographer is. So I look up his website and I look through all of the pictures that he has on his website to see if I can find the one that matches this one. I find it at the bottom. It says it's Barry's clothes, which is spelled B-A-R-R-I-E. So I was like, oh, really cool. Let me look into that and see a little bit more about that. Well, then I find out that this is the way that you get into the Blair Street vaults. So then my mom comes out with her maps and I'm like, where are the Blair Street vaults? They've, they've got to be part of the South Bridge, I'm thinking. And so we're looking and sure enough, Blair Street goes right parallel next to the South Bridge. They're connected to each other. So it's clear that you can go through the Blair Street vaults to get to the underground vaults that are under the South Bridge where they conduct all these ghost tours and such. And just so everybody knows, I don't let people know what I'm going to do anymore unless you're a part of the History Goes Bump Losers Club. You guys over there get to know three or four days before everybody else what episode I'm going to be dropping that week. Well, I hadn't told anybody what I was doing yet. So April had no idea that I was working on the notes for the Edinburgh vaults at the same time that she posted that picture. So another little bit of synchronicity. I was just like, are you psychic, April? Look at the notes I'm working on right now. I just love when that stuff happens. Anyway, let me climb back out of that little side trail I went down and give you a visual of what the vaults are like today. And then imagine that this place is full of people, some possibly with harmful intent for you. The air is dank and damp and cold. The dark gray walls seep water and are crumbling. Those decaying walls are covered in slime and they press in, causing claustrophobia before eventually opening into cavernous spaces. And this is also an underground labyrinth of twists and turns where it's easy to get lost. So this is the living conditions that these people had. And if you go on a ghost tour, that's also what you're going to enter into. 
Mercat Ghost Tours are some of the most well-known ghost tours and the ones that go down into the vaults there in Scotland. They have a guide named Nicola Wright, and she's been working in and around the vaults for over 11 years. And she said, We do get an awful lot of activity, and the reports have been getting more frequent in recent weeks. This is a very sinister place. There are lots of dark, dark spirits down here. Lots of guides have experiences. I train a lot of the guides, and often when they are new, we get a lot of activity because the spirits aren't used to them. They hear things. They get pushed. They hear footsteps. They see faces. Tourists feel things as well. Temperature changes. Quite often, the temperature will drop suddenly. We had reports of footsteps last night, people seeing figures. A lot of time, people are taking pictures and they tell me, you realize there's a woman standing behind you, but I'm fine with it. The tours have recorded some unexplained activity. I myself had a friend take one of these tours several years ago, and they captured a weird green mist in a couple of photos that was not visible with the naked eye. I believe we've talked about this before on a previous podcast, and I've seen that picture, and it is bizarre. It's something that you would imagine seeing if you were going through a haunted house, and they had some smoke that they were throwing green light up on. So how in the world is this place down there getting this weird green mist. And this is something that they could not see with the naked eye. It only showed up in the pictures. Very creepy. On top of that, at the same time that they're getting this picture of this green mist, a young boy that was on the tour with them screams out in terror. He wants to get out of the vaults. He takes off running. They catch up to him and he's complaining that his back hurts. They lift up his shirt and they discover a red handprint as though someone has hit him with the palm of their hand very hard on his back. When you hear these stories or you read them on the internet, it's easy to say, "Uh uh-huh, sure. But I've seen the picture and I heard my friends tell me that story about that young boy. It's not something they made up. There's definitely something going on here and it doesn't seem friendly. Other visitors to the vaults have experienced a full array of ghostly activity from disembodied voices to strange sounds to cold blasts of air to full-bodied apparitions. Each part of the vault has a different name. The wine vault is said to be teeming with activity. The ghost of a young boy named Jack is said to be here, and he's known to grab the hands of visitors. He also likes to throw rocks at them to get their attention. The occult chamber is one of the creepier areas and is rumored to have been a place where satanic rituals and other occult practices were conducted. One legend that seems rather outlandish was that a woman was sacrificed on a mysterious square brick in the center of the chamber after being tortured for days. This brick is still there. You can still see it. That's a story that's connected to it. Whether it actually happened or not, I don't know. But there's a lot of people who claim that this occult chamber has a very dark energy to it. Mr. Boots is the most well-known ghost haunting the vaults. He's described as a shabby and tall man who likes to keep to the back section of the vaults. He throws stones at visitors to get their attention and occasionally pushes them. And the reason why he's called Mr. Boots is because people hear his heavily booted disembodied footsteps coming down the different hallways. And his voice has been heard cursing throughout the chambers. Seems to be a very angry spirit. The White Room is the abode of the spirit that's thought to be the worst here. And his name is The Watcher. This spirit instills feelings of dread into most people, especially psychics who are able to pick up on his energy, and they just feel like, again, we have another malicious spirit here, very dark. This specter gives the chilling feeling of being watched. I know a lot of people describe their ghostly experiences as, I felt like something was watching me. This is a spirit who literally is watching people so much that that's why he's got that nickname. The tour guide that I just mentioned earlier, Nicola, says she won't go into the white room and that people have come out of the room and found that they had scratch marks or bruising. They've had their clothes torn and they feel very nauseous. This is very violent activity you have going on with a spirit here. She also said if you take photographs, quite often faces will appear in them. I won't go into that particular room. He warns people not to enter. He shouts at people and he pushes people. She obviously takes it to heart. She's like, if he doesn't want people to go in there, I'm not going in. If a tour guide is not going to go into a room, I'm going to be a little less likely to go in there as well. 
In 2003, a BBC radio producer named Debbie McPhail wanted to cover the history of the vaults, and she took the Edinburgh Vaults owner down into the underground to conduct the interview. She's just doing a history tour. This isn't a ghost tour. She just wants to get the history of the vaults. The guy who owns it and dug them out, she says, hey, will you come on down here and talk to me? So they record the interview down in the vaults. She goes back to the BBC offices. She's going through the audio like so many paranormal investigators would normally be doing, only she's actually doing what I would be doing, editing the audio, editing the video to see what you captured. And she notices that there's another voice on the tapes that didn't belong to her or the owner. The voice told them to get out. McPhail told reporters, when I was listening back to it, I could hear Nori Rowan, the vault owner, chatting. And then I heard another voice. It was close by to the microphone because you can tell if voices are far away or not. I knew it wasn't the presenter or Nori because the voice had a slightly Irish accent. But I couldn't understand why no one responded to it. When the presenter came back up, I asked him who they had met in the vault, and he said nobody. My husband thought it could be Gaelic, and I asked a colleague who spoke the language, and she said they could be saying, get out or go away. I have no reason to doubt it. You could sit forever and make explanations for it, but it's there on the disc. That's good enough for me. Again, this is a producer for BBC Radio who had no intent of going down there and catching anything ghostly. She just wanted a story. A bartender from a bar right next to the vaults claims that he left an orange on the bar, and when he came back, it had been perfectly peeled, and no one was in the bar with him. Joe Swash spent a night in the vaults by himself in 2009 for a BBC program and picked up the EVP of a Catholic priest reciting the last rites for 20 minutes. I don't think I've ever heard an EVP last more than just a sentence. Imagine 20 minutes of chanting that you've picked up. Nowhere near a Catholic church, there'd be no reason for a Catholic priest to be chanting or giving last rites, and he picked that up. A journalist for The Scotsman reported some experiences they had during a ghost hunt, so they specifically have gone in to do a ghost hunt, and here's what happened to them. In another vault, our guide, Ewan, sensed a room that was at one time used as a men-only drinking tavern. Ewan explained that every tour party he brings into this room splits immediately into male and female groups, which he said was possibly due to previously being a male-dominated environment. A look around the room confirmed this to be true. And let me just say this journalist who wrote this article at the very beginning is very clear that he is skeptical and he doesn't really believe in this stuff. So he goes down into the vaults not expecting anything to happen and expecting to explain if anything happens. He looks around the room, sees that the women and men have split themselves, and thinks to himself, well, that is kind of weird. Why would they do that when they haven't been asked to do that? It just happened. And for the guide to point that out and say this happens every time we come in here, kind of weird. The final room we entered featured a number of large stones laid out in a circle on the floor. We were told that this room had once been used by the witches, who still practice today and especially fitted out room in the vaults. The witches had sensed a mischievous spirit in the room, and it conducted a sermon to trap whatever was lurking within the stone circle. Those who've entered the circle are said to wake up with scratches on their legs the next morning. Here's what's creepy about that story. I'm sure you all picked up on it immediately. It's weird enough when you go into a haunted location and you get scratched by something. If you wake up the next morning and you have scratches that you didn't have the night before, how does that happen? They go through the circle, and then the next morning they wake up with scratches on their legs. Is it just that they didn't feel the scratches when they were in the circle the night before? Or something followed them home and scratched them in their sleep? I don't know. Either one is bad enough. But it's even creepier to me that something might have come home with you and scratched you in your sleep. The Edinburgh vaults have an old and dark history. Many people probably lost their lives here through illness and murder. Is it possible that some of their spirits remain in the underground? Are the Edinburgh vaults haunted? That is is for you to decide. Another great place to check out for sure in Edinburgh. And right up on the hill is Edinburgh Castle, which we've covered in a previous episode. So you can hit both of these places in one trip. Definitely would be awesome to check out. And I've heard just going through some of these closes, these alleyways are pretty creepy because they're very narrow. So definitely something to check out. I do have a link in the show notes for the Mercat Ghost Tours. I believe those are the best ones you can go on there. They offer both history and ghost tours. So if you're not necessarily into the creepy, 
you can still go through and get the history. As I mentioned, I did join Dina on the Twisted Philly podcast, so make sure you check that out. And if you aren't already subscribed to it, you should be. That way you don't miss any of her episodes. They're all great. I want to encourage you guys to check out the website at historygoesbump.com. And for those of you who want to send me some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. I got a lengthy email from James. Thanks so much for writing me, James. I enjoyed you sharing so much about your personal journey and also about your work in studying Route 66. Great road. It's one of those roads that I wish I knew more about. And I really want to get into reading more about it because it's such a deep part of American history having Route 66. And a lot of it has fallen into decay and neglect and people don't remember it anymore because when the interstate system came in, which has been a great thing, all of these side roads like Route 66 fell to the wayside and the businesses that were along it died and that kind of thing. So just like to know more about it. And there's so much that's haunted along Route 66. Historical Blindness is doing an episode on Spring Hill Jack and you might hear a familiar voice on there. I do a little bit of voiceover for it. I encourage you to check out Historical Blindness as well. It's a great podcast. Make sure you mark your calendars for October 28th. It's a Sunday. It's the last Sunday in October, right before Halloween. We're going to do another cemetery bingo. We're working on a single card for everybody to be working off of. It'll be blackout bingo again. So you try to get as many symbols as you can. This has got a lot of different ones that haven't appeared on any of the other cards in the past. You can do it anytime that day. So just be planning to visit a cemetery on October 28th. I have a few reviews from Apple Podcasts to share with you. And Fur, Great Balance of History and Spooks, five stars. HGB delivers history with a side of spookiness. This podcast is entertaining not only for history lovers, but paranormal lovers as well. You may learn something new about your own hometown. Well, thank you, Anne. I love sharing stuff with people that they don't know is in their own backyard. Disney Girl 24, excited to learn something new, five stars. I love this podcast. It's the best. It combines my two favorite things, history and the supernatural. I always look forward to learning something new about our past and what could still be sticking around in the afterlife. As a witch myself, I love how respectful you are of the dead and all religions you discuss on your podcast. Your open minds are refreshing in the present political climate. History shows how far we've come and yet how we still don't learn from our past mistakes. Keep up the good work. P.S. I love the chit chat before each episode. Don't ever change for the naysayers. Stay spooky, Ariel. Well, thank you so much for sharing that, Ariel. You obviously are early on in the podcast as you work your way down. You'll find that there is a little less chit chat or back and forth because it's just little old me here now. And we did change some things for some of the naysayers. So we don't have as much talking in the beginning and moved it more back here to the back end, which I think everybody preferred anyway. So we made some changes that I think were okay with everybody. But thank you for listening. Greatly appreciate that. And yes, we love everybody here. I don't care what you practice as long as you're not harming anybody. I have no problem with your religious belief. Make changes for me, Deb. Great mix of the things I love. Five stars. Diane never fails in her presentation. It's always spot on and very well done. She captures both the things I enjoy, history and ghost stories. I look forward to this podcast each week. One of my favorites. Well, I'm so glad that you had to say that, Deb. I love being everybody's favorite. I want to thank all of you for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode has been brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to welcome into the graveyard, Deborah Kinney. You're going to be getting a garden crypt. And Christine Klein, thank you so much for raising your donation. You're going to be moving into a mausoleum. Mort, do you think it's possible that you could get a hold of some Tiffany stained glass for Christine's mausoleum? I think it's time that we jazz these things up a little bit. I'll dig up Louis Tiffany right now. By the way, it's me everybody loves. Mort, you are the man. I prefer sexy grave dude. Be sociable. Drop the chain rattling, neck biting, and shape shifting. And join us on Facebook and Twitter at History Goes Bump. Like the page and follow us.